Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season, we're addressing the various parables of Jesus, which are contained in the Gospels. And this week, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, which is found in the Gospel of Luke. This is a pretty long parable, but there's only one version to analyze, so let's take a look. There was a certain rich man, who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and feasted sumptuously every day. Luke 16, 19 This first verse tells us not only that the first man is rich, but how he spent his money. He spent some of it on plenty of good food, day in and day out. He also spent it on expensive clothes to make himself look good. We know this because the verse specifically mentions linen, which was an expensive fabric back then, and purple. In those days, it was hard to get clothes in certain colors, and purple was one of the pricier ones. This verse is saying that the man was deliberately ostentatious with his wealth. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus who lay at his gate, full of sores, desiring to be filled with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table, and no one did give him. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Luke 16, 20 to 21. Technically, a sore can be any wound that's inflamed or red, but you can also get sores from being out in the elements, especially very hot weather, and unable to wash yourself properly. This can cause chafing, which can lead to painful sores. It's more than likely that Lazarus got his sores from a cause like this, having to do with his poverty, and the fact that no one took pity on him and helped him. In fact, they let their dogs irritate his sores even further. He was a man who was never shown mercy or relief, and even one kind stranger with a piece of cloth, a sandwich, and a pail of water could have done so. And it came to pass that the beggar died, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died, and he was buried in hell. Luke 16.22 Abraham's bosom here refers to a realm of death where Abraham and the other good people were, and is distinguished from hell. At the time, the afterlife wasn't well understood by the Jews, but they called it Sheol, and it was a place of silence, darkness, and inaction, like an actual grave. What Jesus is referring to here is different, a comforting place surrounded by your ancestors. Christian theologians have speculated that this may have been a type of afterlife that existed before the death of Jesus opened up heaven for us, a place where the souls of good people were kept away from punishment until God could grant them eternal life through his Son. They've called it the Limbo of the Fathers, and it's generally believed to no longer be a destination of souls. And lifting up his eyes when he was in torments, he saw Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Luke 16, 23-24 Lots of information about hell here, flames, torments, thirst, and the ability, apparently, to witness the fates of those in other afterlifes. That last one is the only one I question because all the others share a common theme. They're all about the removal of something good from the life of a person. Being in flames removes security and bodily integrity. Being in torment removes comfort and the support of those around you. Being in thirst removes the satisfaction of our needs. Things which should be ours can be lost to ourselves if we make the same mistakes this man did. And Abraham said to him, Son, remember that thou didst receive good things in thy lifetime, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Luke 16.25 Not that having good things is a sin in itself, but rather that not helping those around us who are obviously in need is. It was obvious to anyone willing to see that Lazarus needed help, but the rich man never raised a finger to help him. Furthermore, it's not as though Lazarus was some stranger from downtown who the rich man only saw once in a blue moon. As we saw in verse 20, Lazarus lay right at the rich man's gate. Day after day, he would have had to practically step over the man, and day after day, he did nothing to help him. If not for this, Lazarus might have endured less evil things, and perhaps the rich man's soul could have been saved. And besides all this, between us and you there is fixed a great chaos, so that they who would pass from hence to you cannot, nor from thence come hither. Luke 16.26 The word that's translated as chaos here means something strong and hard to overcome. It could refer to a gulf, or to a barrier of some kind. 
but in any case, it prevents people from crossing from one afterlife to another. This makes perfect sense if the very reason for their presence in their particular afterlife has something to do with the state of their soul, something that no one else can alter. And he said, Then, Father, I beseech thee, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torments. Luke 16, 27-28 This may or may not refer to his biological brothers. The term brethren could mean any of a number of different members of a person's extended family. However, whoever he's talking about, it seems they tend towards the same kinds of sinfulness and mercilessness as he does. Otherwise, there would be no need to warn them against it. There's also been a lot of debate over why the rich man asks for this over the centuries. After all, it does seem to imply that a person in hell can wish for the good of another person, something that's not consistent with what we know about hell. However, St. Thomas Aquinas wrote that he may be seeing the salvation of his brethren only from the perspective of a personal victory, because he thinks of these people as part of himself in his own life, rather than out of some benevolent desire to selflessly assist them. I suppose that's possible. And Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one went to them from the dead, they will do penance. And he said to him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they believe if one rise again from the dead. Luke sixteen twenty nine to 31 Sometimes it's just obvious what the right thing to do is, and other times it becomes clear when we think the matter over after someone warns us about it. This is what Abraham refers to when he talks about Moses and the prophets. They warned the people to turn away from their evil, which should have given them sufficient motivation to reconsider their decisions. However, for some people, doing wrong isn't about needing to reconsider anything or a simple mistake. They do it because they want to, and become so set in their ways that no one can convince them otherwise. No matter what, they obstinately persist in their grave evil. These sorts of people will be angry if someone rises from the dead to prove them wrong, just as the Pharisees were angry when Jesus brought his friend, also named Lazarus, back from the dead. But it won't make them change or reconsider their priorities. Remember, when Lazarus, the friend of Jesus, was brought back, the Pharisees didn't spend time thinking about what that meant or the significance of the miracle. Instead, they plotted to kill Lazarus because when it came down to it, they didn't care what God really wanted only about protecting their narrative and supporting their position of worldly power and wealth. I can't condemn the Pharisees or anyone else for being ambitious or for liking wealth, power, or pleasure, but I can criticize them for forgetting about what really matters and focusing too much on their fate in this tiny world and too little on the ultimate fate that God wants to give everyone. We should never forget the inevitable reality of death and what that means for ourselves and our real destination. Because of that, we should also never forget about the will of God, the factor that has the power to make some difference in terms of what happens when our time on earth is up. I think this parable is closer to that topic than most. Next, the talents. That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.